Clinical Chemistry, Cardiovascular Disorders, Pathophysiology, and Diagnostic Correlation. There's different types of heart disease that exist, including infective, congenital, or hypertensive. Infective are related to rheumatic heart disease, infectious endocarditis, pericarditis, and it's treated with antibiotics. Congenital, physiological defects that are corrected by surgery. Hypertension are really, is related to high blood pressure and corrected by diet, exercise, and medication. Congenital heart diseases, the etiology is often unknown. Environmental and genetic factors play a role. Factors associated with congenital defects, maternal rubella infection, maternal alcohol abuse, drug treatment or radiation with drugs that cross the placenta, genetic chromosomal abnormalities. Congestive heart failure versus coronary heart disease. Congestive heart failure is characterized by edema in the lungs and the rest of the body. It's characterized by, or it's caused by coronary artery disease that has progressed to um, this congestive heart failure issue. Also cardiomyopathies, myocarditis, valvular disease, and cardiac arrhythmias. So what happens with um, any type of heart damage or heart issue, if it's harder for the heart to pump blood that means that blood flow throughout the body is going to slow. So the heart's going to try to push the blood, whether it's an arrhythmia where the electrical portion of getting the heart to contract doesn't work properly, or whether there's a portion of the heart that has like stenosis in the valves, or um, there's some type of blockage that is killing part of the heart muscle tissue, or there's not enough oxygen going to a certain part of the heart, which leads to the inability of that part of the heart to make energy and kind of slows down the pumping. Either way, when you have congestive heart failure, it's caused by the heart not pumping fast enough or good enough. So then you have fluids that move through the body a lot slower. And when fluids are allowed to sit in an area for a period of time, the fluid is going to leak out of the bloodstream and into the tissues. When it does that, you're going to have generalized edema and edema around the lungs and around the heart. And that's when it's called congestive heart failure. If you think about like when you're congested, when you get a cold and it's stuffy and it's hard for you to breathe, that's kind of what's going to happen. And this congestive heart failure sets itself on a very destructive, positive feedback loop such that the more or the slower the heart, the more fluid is going to accumulate, which makes it even harder for the heart to pump, which makes more fluid accumulate, which makes it even harder to have the heart pump and more fluid, more difficult pumping, more fluid, more difficult pumping, which kind of escalates to eventually death. Um, in order to correct this, usually congestive heart failure patients require a heart transplant. Coronary heart disease is ischemia, which leads to angina pectoris or myocardial infarct. Ischemia is a constriction in blood flow. Angina pectoris is chest pain. And myocardial infarct refers to a blockage in the blood vessels, the coronary arteries that feed the heart muscle tissue, and that prevents adequate blood flow and oxygen reperfusion or oxygen exchange at that site, which means you suffocate the heart muscle tissue no energy can be produced and that heart muscle tissue dies. When that happens, the extent of the heart attack and whether a person will live or die from that heart attack depends on the amount of damage to the heart muscle tissue. If a very small blood vessel was blocked and a very small region of muscle is impacted, then a person can have a heart attack and live. However, if the blood vessel is blocked early, which means a wider range of muscle tissue is impacted, more of the heart muscle tissue will die and the person has a less likely chance of surviving. Symptoms of heart disease, common symptoms, dyspnea or inability to breathe properly, syncope fading, cyanosis is bluing of the skin, angina pectoris, chest pain, Palpitations, you can feel fluttering in your chest. Fatigue and edema is an accumulation of fluid in the tissues. Unusual symptoms would be cough, abdominal pain, but abdominal pain is pretty common, a pretty common um, 
presentation of a heart attack in women. So women and men kind of feel heart attacks a little bit differently. And a lot of times women will complain of chest pain when they're having a heart attack, or sorry, abdominal pain, um, in addition to the chest pain when they're having a heart attack. Sometimes it's just abdominal pain. So they will present with unknown cause, idiopathic abdominal pain, and come to find out after drawing some labs that they were having a heart attack. Hemoptysis, headache, sweating, vision and speech disturbance, weakness of extremities, weight loss, nausea, vomiting, fever. Hypertension, high blood pressure, defined as systolic, the higher of the two numbers, 160, and diastolic, 95, the lower of the two numbers. Um, so once greater than 160, greater than 95 would indicate hypertension. Incidence increases with age. So 4% at age 20 to 29, 50% at middle age, 65% over age 80. If you think about it, as a kid, your body is utilizing the majority of the nutrients that come in because you're growing. But as soon as you reach age like 25-ish, you stop growing so much and you start to get into more of a stable state. And your, the nutrients that are coming into your body are no longer really going to be used for growing. They're going to be used for shaping your musculature. Um, people get really active in sports or active in their careers or um, kind of set down that path in life where they're going to mo or model their body into what's going to prepare them for the rest of their future. Then once you hit uh, about 40, that's typically when we start to see excess nutrient consumption and those nutrients aren't really used properly. So people tend to um, become a little bit more sedentary, a little bit um, less likely to go out and do major activities or um, try to accomplish new things. So as they start to become a little more sedentary and they continue to consume the same diet that they have been consuming to maintain all of those excess activities that they were used to, that's when we start to see excess nutrients accumulate in the body and they can accumulate as fat and that fat can accumulate underneath the skin between or underneath the abdominal muscles, which causes the abdominal obesity, which we talked about with metabolic syndrome, but it can also accumulate in the blood vessels. And when we have that accumulation in the blood vessels, that's where we're gonna see a narrowing of the inside of the blood vessels. If you've ever been in summertime and went outside with a garden hose and you see the water pouring out the end of the garden hose, as soon as you put your thumb over the end of the garden hose, you're going to see water spurt out at a much faster rate. And that's all due to Boyle's Law. If you remember from chemistry class, Boyle's Law states that um, pressure and volume are inversely related. So when you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. So just like that garden hose in your backyard, think about your blood vessels as a garden hose. Blood should be freely flowing through them, but your thumb is like atherosclerosis. It's going to be lipids or cholesterol or different types of substances, even glucose could accumulate that's going to form plaques inside of your blood vessels. So those plaques are going to be like your thumb that's over the end of the hose. That's going to cause blood to spurt through your bloodstream at a much higher rate. And that spurting of the blood through the blood, uh, through the cardiovascular system, that is how we measure blood pressure. So a good blood pressure, they always say 120 over 80 is good. Um, a bad blood pressure would be anything over that, but a really bad blood pressure, that's hypertension, and that's greater than 160 or greater than 95 um, on the diastolic. High blood pressure affects all organs. So if you think about that garden hose again, and you think about you wanna wash off your back patio, and let's say you've got all these different like rocks on your back patio. If you let the water slowly pour on the rocks, then they're going to wash off nicely and evenly. If you put your thumb over the end of that garden hose and you let the water spurt out at the rocks, it's going to blast those rocks all over the place. And that's what happens when you start to have an increased blood pressure. You can blow out your capillary beds and that can impact blood flow and nutrient exchange at those um, essential tissue sites. You can cause a lot of tissue damage when you have an increase in blood pressure. Hypertensive heart disease caused by an increase in peripheral resistance 
And as I mentioned, that increase in peripheral resistance is kind of like putting your thumb over the end of the hose. Plaques start to accumulate. And when you have plaques accumulate in the inside of your blood vessels, that's going to cause an increased resistance. It's more difficult for blood to flow through when there's plaques that it's bumping up against. Increases the workload or left ventri- of the left ventricle, resulting in hypertrophy and dilation. Hypertrophy, we learned about, is an increase in the size of the cells and dilation, so it's going to widen. Um, Sometimes you'll hear about an enlarged heart. An enlarged heart means that this process has already started happening. Causes mitral valve to allow regurgitation of the blood into the left atrium. Results in dilation, increased pressure in the left atrium, increased pressure transferred to the right side of the heart. And that's associated with an increased prevalence of atherosclerosis. Again, atherosclerosis is the accumulation of plaques on the inside of the blood vessels. There's primary versus secondary hypertension. Primary um, hypertension in 90 to 95% of patients, there's no known cause. It's multifactorial, so genetics, race, gender, environmental. The cardiac output factors and peripheral vascular factors also play a role. Secondary hypertension has an identified source of the problem. Renal disease associated with sodium retention. Malignant hypertension, so severe renal disease causes renal cell inflammation and destruction. Primary primary aldosteronism due to abnormal control of electrolyte excretion. Pheochromocytoma, which is due to an increase in the excretion of catecholamines from Crothman tumor. Congestive heart failure affects 1 in 100 people in the United States. It results from the inability of the heart to pump blood efficiently or effectively. That's what I just described previously. So the blood or the heart is moving a lot slower and that allows that fluid to accumulate. When the left side fails, the excess fluid accumulates in the lungs. You see pulmonary edema or fluid accumulating around the lungs, reduced output due uh, to systemic circulation, and the kidneys respond with excessive fluid retention, making the heart failure worse. If the right side fails, you have excess uh, fluid accumulating in systemic venous circulation, and you end up with generalized edema, diminished blood flow to the lungs, left side of the heart, and decreased cardiac output to the systemic systemic arterial circulation. Laboratory diagnosis of congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is different from a heart attack, so we are referring to congestive heart failure here. So you'd see an elevated blood urea nitrogen or BUN. Measurement of the serum urea nitrogen, enzymatic methods and direct methods exist. An increased BUN is also associated with renal failure. So the BUN to creatinine ratio provides a rough indication of the cause of the renal failure. In congestive heart failure, you have an elevated BUN with normal creatinine. In um, If you're having renal issues, then you would have an elevated BUN and um, you would have a low creatinine clearance because the kidneys aren't able to filter out the blood um, appropriately. Uremia is an increase in blood urea. Azotemia is an increase in nitrogen-containing end products, including urea, urea, creatinine, and uric acid. Brain natriuretic peptide, BNP, is another indicator of congestive heart failure. Again, we're talking about congestive heart failure, CHF, not myocardial infarction or a heart attack. It's released in response to ventricle volume expansion and pressure overload. It works in tandem with atrial natriuretic peptide. It's approved for the diagnosis of CHF. So greater than 100 picograms per mil, CHF is like unlikely. 100 to 400, it's likely. Greater than 400, it's very likely. And it provides prognostic information such that the higher the level, the worse the prognosis. Coronary heart disease is caused by a lack of nutrients and oxygen supply to the heart muscle. So your heart is a muscle. Its job is to pump blood around the body. The heart as a muscle requires its own blood supply. So you have blood vessels on the surface of the heart called coronary arteries. And that's why we call it coronary heart disease related to the coronary arteries. Those arteries get blocked with plaques. And when they get blocked with plaques, that's known as ischemia. Ischemia is a constriction 
of blood flow due to atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the formation of those plaques. Once you have ischemia, it can cause some angina pectoris or chest pain, which then escalates to the potential of a complete blockage. If you do have a complete blockage in blood flow to the heart, that is a myocardial infarction. So first, you have plaques accumulating, atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. This is going to lead into a decreased transport of nutrients and oxygen to the heart muscle. That results in myocardial ischemia. Ischemia is just talking about a constriction of blood flow to an area of the body. Again, that's due to atherosclerosis, thrombosis, spasms, embolisms, and it can also be due to anemia. Coronary heart disease risk factors. It's common after the age of 40. Males more common than premenopausal women, but after menopause, women affected similarly. A family history and smoking. There's a direct relationship between the number of cigarettes smoked and congestive or coronary heart disease in men. And it's related to decreased HDL, increased LDL, increased platelet adhesion, vasoconstriction, increased fibrinogen, and clot formation. It's not well characterized in women or those who smoke pipes or cigars. Hypertension, both systolic and diastolic hypertension for both men and women, sedentary lifestyle, response to stress, diabetes mellitus due to associated vascular disease, especially when diabetes is not well controlled. Hyperlipidemia, increased serum cholesterol, especially LDL cholesterol. D-dimer, produced during clot degradation, two identical domains, primary and secondary fibrolin fibron fibrinolysis, tissue plasminogen activator as a result of thrombotic disease, detected by monoclonal antibody, and there's false negatives and false positives that are possible. So the consequences of ischemia could lead to congestive heart failure, angina pectoris, um, which are symptoms of inadequate perfusion, chest pain without tissue damage, unstable angina is most severe, present at rest, and progresses rapidly to a myocardial infarction. It's difficult to differentiate this from a myocardial infarction, but there's no el enzyme elevations and or characteristic ECG changes. Myocardial infarction is defined by the history of chest pain, abnormal electrocardiogram, and biochemical markers. It occurs when blood flow to the heart is suddenly blocked, leading to ischemia and death of myocardial tissues. Area of blockage becomes inflamed and necrotic, followed by release of cellular enzymes. Damage is irreversible. The necrotic tissue is replaced by fibrous scar tissue. So whether you have a minor heart attack or a major heart attack, if you survive, the heart muscle tissue can never grow back as heart muscle tissue. Myocytes, or heart muscle cells, are terminally differentiated cells. They do not have the ability to reproduce. So they slip from that cell cycle, they slip into the G0 phase where they cannot reproduce, and we can't replace them with anything. So once they die, they actually come back as, or get repaired as, fibrous connective tissue. And that's scar tissue that now serves as dead weight on the heart. So if you have a small amount of scar tissue, it may not have too bad of an impact on your heart muscle function. But if you had a major heart attack, you have a very large area of scar tissue that grows back. So one of the things that can happen after a heart attack is you survive and you have a wake up call, you start to do your diet and exercise, you stay on your medication and you try to really take care of your health. But even despite all of that, the scar tissue creates a weakened spot in the heart. And suddenly, after having a heart attack, if that weakened spot ruptures or breaks open, you can bleed out in your chest and die. And that can happen very suddenly without much of a warning. So that's something to keep in mind um, and think about, you know, as you go through your life and make choices about what to eat and not eat and your own personal health and wellness taking your own personal health and wellness very seriously can prevent those bad things from happening later on in life. So um, like I said, any type of heart attack is bad, 
but the extent of where the coronary artery was blocked determines the extent of damage, which determines the extent of the scar tissue. That scar tissue is going to be dead weight. So even if it doesn't rupture later on in life, it's not going to be contributing in the pumping of the heart. It's not going to contract anymore. So it's literally dead weight that's now flopping on the surface of your heart. That also makes it more difficult for your heart to pump. Your heart is going to slow down in its contractions which leads to that congestive heart failure and it can progress into that congestive heart failure and eventual death. Diagnosis. So two of the three are necessary. Patient history, serum markers, or EKG changes. If only one of those is present, then we cannot say it's a myocardial infarction. So the use of card cardiac markers is the most important for this class, because this is a clinical chemistry class. Um, so cardiac markers is what we can measure in the blood. When individuals do not have the characteristic ECG changes or a patient history, this is something that we can look at to see what's going on with the patient's heart. Characteristics of an ideal marker, it would be abundant in cardiac cells exclusive to myocytes or heart muscle cells. There's a rapid release after myocardial injury, and it persists in the plasma um, for a while, but not so long as to mask recurrent infarction. It's easy to measure and has rapid test methodology. The ideal marker does not exist. So today, we're still trying to find the right balance of what markers to use. Before, we used to use like lactate dehydrogenase and myoglobin, and those were a portion of this lecture for a really long time. Today, those are no longer used in clinical practice. So those have been phased out. And while, now we use more of the troponin and CK um, isoenzymes. So we're going to go through the current markers that are used today. But trying to find that ideal marker is tough. Many of the markers or the um, substances that are found inside of myocytes are also found in other types of cells. So um, like myoglobin, for example, you could tear a muscle and have the same elevation of myoglobin in the blood as if you are having a heart attack. It's not specific to heart muscle tissue, so that makes it a really tough marker. Myoglobin also had the issue of only being present um, quickly and quickly going away. So if you weren't getting your blood work done within the first few hours of having a heart attack, those values wouldn't really be prevalent. You wouldn't see them. And sometimes people can go days without going to the hospital to get seen for um, non-discriminant or non-severe chest pain. And turns out they had a heart attack all along and it goes undiagnosed. So um, that's why that one was kind of phased out. Determination of marker sensitivity and specificity, the size, cellular location, release ratio, clearance, and the specificity for the heart all play a factor. So markers of myocardial injury, so aspartate aminotransferase has a low tissue specificity and an intermediate diagnostic window. So from the time that the patient actually has the heart attack to the time that they get seen and have that measured. Um, the other thing to consider though is that you usually don't get one measurement or one read on these markers. Usually you have a panel of markers that is read multiple times during the patient's stay. So you get a baseline as soon as they come in, and then you get more labs drawn in a few hours and more labs in a few hours so that you can see a serial draw and see if the levels are going up or down or what's happening to them. Creatinine kinase has a medium tissue specificity and intermediate diagnostic window. Creatinine kinase MB has a high tissue specificity, but it um, appears early to intermediate for diagnostic window. LD, LD1, and myoglobin are no longer commonly used, so those ones you don't really have to worry about for this class. Cardiac troponin I has absolute specificity and an intermediate diagnostic window. So here you can see what happens to the different enzymes. You can see CKMB, the um, one that's specific to muscle, is going to increase and stay high for quite some time. AST has a moderate increase and then kind of stays elevated for a while. We don't really worry about LD anymore. And CK, you can see the increase and in how it levels off. 
Aspartate aminotransferase, or ASCOT, also known as AST. We talked about this in the liver. It's also elevated and prevalent in the heart. Creatinine kinase, or CK isoenzymes. CKBB is pre predominantly in the brain. CK2, or CKMB, is relatively specific to the heart. Less than 2% of total CK in skeletal muscle. So it can be found in skeletal muscle, but it's more specific to the heart. CK3, CKMM, is in cardiac and skeletal muscle. So when we look at this, so this is an electrophoretic um, pattern. So we can see CK1 migrates the most, CK2 is next, and then CK3 is next. So that's how we labeled them. So on the test and on the qualifying exam, you may see CK1 or you may see CKBB. In practice, I more often see like the BBMM, um, MB version rather than the 1, 2, 3, but you need to be prepared for both. So CKMB is the one that's most specific to the heart. So if you're asked a test question on which creatinine kinase um, or creatine kinase isoenzyme is most prevalent in the heart, you're going to say CKMB or CK2. CK2 becomes elevated four to six hours post MI. It peaks at 24 hours, but then it returns to normal pretty quickly. So we can see it peak and then it's back to normal. So if someone waits four or five days before they come in to get tested, then we may miss it altogether. Determination is electrophoretically or enzymatically. Measure total after the removal of the M subunit and after the removal of the B subunit, you can calculate. CK2 equals total CK minus the total M plus the total B. Immunoassay with antibody specific for CK2. Demonstrate excellent concordance with enzymatic methods. Factors that affect CK2 levels, the size of the infarct or blockage, CK2 composition in myocardium, concontaminant with skeletal muscle issue or injury, sorry. Large amounts of total CK from muscle injury may mask the absolute amount of CK2. Reperfusion, so monitoring CK2 assists in monitoring reperfusion therapy. Tissue plasminogen activator. Successful therapy is associated with a rapid increase in all markers and an early peak. Rapid increase in CK2, myoglobin, CTNT, CTNI provide high specificity at predicting successful reperfusion. Successful monitoring necessitates frequent sampling and rapid analysis of markers. So here's what can happen during reperfusion. So blood flow is temporarily stopped to that area of the body. Eventually blood flow will resume to that area. In the process though, you have a lot of necrosis. There's a lot of inflammatory molecules and a lot of toxic substances that build up in the area when there's an area of tissue damage. When you suddenly restore blood supply to that area, all of those toxins are then carried through the blood at a very quick rate. So sometimes when we have that reperfusion happen or blood flow returns to the area, it can cause greater damage leading to some pretty profound consequences. Troponin, so if you remember A&P and learning about the skeletal muscle contraction or the muscle contraction in general, um, you remember learning about troponin, tropomyosin, and um, calcium and the, the role that calcium plays in um, mediating that uh, heart muscle contraction. So troponin C is the calcium binding subunit. Troponin I is the inhibitory subunit, which inhibitates ATPase. Troponin T interacts with tropomyosin, and it's localized primarily to the myofibrils. A small amount is found in cytoplasm. Cardiac-specific troponin isoform, so troponin T, TNT, or C, TNT, cardiac-specific TNT. Cardiac-specific and skeletal muscle-specific forms encoded by separate genes. Small amounts are found in skeletal muscle during development in regenerating muscle and in disease muscle. Muscular dystrophy, poly, polymyositis, chronic renal disease, you can also see it. Troponin I, TNI or CTNI is cardiac specific and skeletal muscle specific 
in two different forms. Encoded by separate genes, CTNI not observed in normal diseased or regenerating skeletal muscle. So this is a diagram that shows CTNI and CTNT, and you can take a look at those and how they would be found in bound, free in the cytoplasm, and in the blood. CTNT is insufficient for effective to early diagnosis. 50 to 60% sensitivity for up to six hours after a myocardial infarction, similar to CK2. Sensitivity is greater than CK2 at later time points, five to seven days after a myocardial infarction. Detects those patients with unstable angina or mild cardiac injury. Indicates increased risk for myocardial infarction. Differentiate individuals with increased CK2 due to skeletal injury from those with concomitant MI. Excellent marker for myocardial injury in the presence of other conditions, sepsis, drug tox induced toxicities, chronic disease, malignancy, hematologic disorders, or non-cardiac surgery. CTNI is comparable to CK2 for detection of MI, similar kinetics, and it stays elevated longer. It's insufficient for very early diagnosis of MI. Specific for myocardium, remains undetectable in cases of skeletal muscle injury with no cardiac involvement. It's also not elevated with excessive exercise, with the Shane's muscular dystrophy, chronic renal failure, or with dialysis. It's useful for the diagnosis of perioperative MI in non-cardiac surgery. The detection is by chemiluminescent assay. Secondary antibody labeled um, complex acid treatment releases the photon from the dye. Amount of photons released are proportional to the troponin T present in the solution. CTNI is by fluorescent immunoassay. And here you can see the kinetics of CTNT, CTNI, within the myocardial infarction. So the circles right here that you see, the closed in circles, are CTNI. You can see when it elevates and then it declines, but it stays elevated for a pretty long period of time. C um, TNT is this guy here, and you can see what happens to that. It starts to, de to decline um, at 48 hours, a little bit more than CTNI. Advantages of those measurements, CTNI, CTNT remain elevated five to 10 days, low to undetectable in serum levels in the absence of cardiac disease, and there's cardiac specificity. Advantage is it replaces the LD measurement in late presenting cases of MI. There's lower discriminator values and eliminates false positive diagnosis of myocardial infarctions with elevated CK2 due to muscle injury or disease. Other causes of increased troponin T are listed here. So trauma, cardiac surgery, post-op, non-cardiac surgery, hypertension, hypotension, acute neurological disease, rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, critically ill, hypothyroidism, myocarditis, pulmonary embolism, and sepsis. The risk stratification, so using cardiac ma markers to identify patients with unstable angina at increased risk for MI. Up to 30% progress to MI or cardiac death within one year of the initial presentation of CTNI, CTNT, or CK2. 25 to 33% of unstable angina patients have increased CTNI, CTNT, or both. 20 to 35% are uh, percent present with increased levels within 24 hours of symptoms progress to myocardial uh, infarction or cardiac death within one month. Measure at presentation and then 12 hours later. We talked about the lipoproteins and atherosclerosis and the likelihood of lipoproteins determining the outcome of myocardial infarction, cardiac health, or cardiovascular health, and um, when lipids are good and bad and what levels they should be at. So the formation of lesions, lesions start as fatty streaks. They progress to fibrous plaques that are partially occluding the vessel. The disruption of the plaque promotes the formation of an occlusive thrombus, leading to acute myocardial infarction, stroke, gangrene, or aneurysm. So when you have something inside of the blood vessels that blocks it, 
and forms a plaque. If that plaque gets dislodged, now it's a clot. And if it's dislodged, it is an embolism. And an embolism is a clot that's floating through your bloodstream. Those emboli can go to various portions of the body. They can get lodged in any blood vessel that feeds any region of the body. If they get lodged in a portion of the blood vessel that feeds your finger, you could lose blood supply to your finger and that can cause gangrene. If it gets lodged in a blood vessel that feeds your brain, you can have a stroke. If it gets lodged into a um, blood vessel leading to the heart, then that can cause acute myocardial infarction. All of these types of lesions are associated with dyslipoproteinemias. So changes associated with increased risk. If you see an increase in LDL cholesterol, an increase in small dense lipoprotein, increase in triglycerides, um, or a decrease in HDL, those are more likely associated with atherosclerosis. Secondary causes, diet, drugs, metabolic disorders, and diseases. Primary dyslipidemia is increased production of lipoproteins, abnormal intravascular processing, or defective cellular uptake of lipoproteins. Diagnosis of lipid and lipoprotein disorders. You want to look at total cholesterol, fasting or non-fasting, and then you do a fasting lipid profile, total cholesterol, total triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, then you can calculate um, the HDL ratio and LDL cholesterol from that. Ultracentrifugation allows us to determine VLDL, LDL, and HDL. The Friedwald formula is something that's extremely important that you need to write down, remember, not only for this cl class, but again for the qualifying exam. Your LDL of cholesterol is equal to your total cholesterol minus your HDL minus the triglycerides divided by 5. Laboratory analysis of hyperlipidemia, pre-analytical factors, so patient preparation. If it's a fasting lipid panel, you got to make sure that they fast. Maintain a normal diet and lifestyle for three days prior. Patient should be um, healthy, no acute or recent illness. Fast for at least 20, 12 hours prior to the fasting lipid panel. Required for analysis of triglycerides, ApoB, calculated LDLC. Recommended for the analysis of total cholesterol, HDLC, LDLC by direct method, Apple A A I, Apple A2, LPA. Avoid hemoconcentration, and the analysis is performed on serum or EDTA plasma. Plasma appearance if there's a creamy layer on top, there's an increase in chylomicrons. If it's lipemic, like your serum or plasma looks turbid or milky, you have increased VLDL or IDL. If there's no turbidity and it's slightly orange, you have an increased LDL. And if it's normal and clear, you have an increased HDL, which is a good thing. Total cholesterol routine method is enzymatic, and this is the equation for how it is determined. Triglycerides, hydrogen peroxide coupled method, and here is the equation for how we would measure the color change photo, uh, photo spec, spectra photometrically. Triglycerides, pyruvate lactate dehydrogenase coupled reaction. You can see the reaction here, and then that's measured uh, spectrophotometrically. Okay. Triglyceride measurement, endogenous glycerol. Normal individuals, endogenous glycerol is less than 10 mg per deciliter. Mm -hmm. Conditions where high concentrations of endogenous glycerol exist include diabetes, mellitus, emotional stress, IV drugs and nutrition, contamination of blood collective devices, prolonged storage of non-refrigerated blood, measure endogenous glycerol by omitting lipase, hydrolysis of triglycerides. HDL cholesterol. The routine method, precipitate ApoB100 using a polyanion in the presence of divalent cations. It removes VLDL, IDL, LPA, LDL, and chylomicrons, and then we can measure it. Interference by triglycerides. If triglycerides are greater than 400 mg per deciliter, you can't do any of the other lipid testing. So you would have to ultra centrifuge the samples to remove the triglycerides, 
and then you can evaluate um, those lipids afterwards. So this is another important note to make note of. If triglycerides are greater than 400, you can't um, measure the other lipids unless you do additional steps. Direct measurement of HDLC. HDLC in serum is measured selectively without prior precipitation of other lipoproteins. Modification, cholesterol esterase, cholesterol oxidase, inclusion of alpha cyclodextran in the reaction mix. Tangier disease is caused by an increased catabolism of HDL, defect in catabolism of ApoAI, severely reduced plasma HDL, abnormal HDL composition, results from deposition of cholesterol es esters, hyperplastic orange tonsils, splenomegaly or enlargement of the spleen, peripheral neuropathy, hepatomegaly, enlargement of the liver, corneal opacity is also noted. Homozygotes may have increased risk of um, CHG. Heterozygotes exhibit no clinical manifestations. Again, that LDL most commonly we would measure it indirectly. So we measure total cholesterol, HDL, and triglycerides, and then we calculate it. If triglycerides exceed 400 mg, you cannot do it that way. So you would have to um, ultra centrifuge and get the values a different way. Beta quantification, it's used when the free walled equation is inappropriate. So again, if it's um, triglycerides are over 400, I uh, can't do it. So beta quantification, VLDL equals the total cholesterol minus D greater than 1.006 grams per mil cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is equal to D greater than 1.006 um, mix or mil cholesterol minus the HDL cholesterol. Direct measurement of LDL, precipitate LDL with polyvinyl sulfate or heparin at low pH, and then it's measured in the precipitate. Lipoprotein measurement, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry, detects lipoprotein-associated fatty acyl methyl and methylene groups, can determine each lipoprotein fraction separately. So VLDL, IDL, LDL, LPA, HDL. This is not commonly used in practice, so this is more like a research-based, um, and it's pretty rare to use this method. Ultracentrifugation will lead to... Um, Chylomicrons being on the top, followed by VLDL, and then IDL, LDL, and then HDL, and then you can run it on agarose electrophoresis and separate out the different portions. And here you can see lipoprotein electrophoresis here, and you can pause the video and take a look at this diagram of where those bands would come out. So again, classification of risk of CHD. Total cholesterol less than 200 is good. 200 to 239, borderline high risk. Greater than 240, high risk. LDL less than 130 is good. 130 to 160 is borderline high risk. Greater than 160, high risk. HDL less than 40, you're at a high risk. Greater than 40 is desirable. Greater than 60 is protective. And this is in MIGs per liter instead of MIGs per deciliter. And this is for children and adolescents. So they're allowed a little bit higher values just because they are growing and they are going to be using those excess nutrients. And again, this is in MIGs per liter instead of MIGs per deciliter. So you can take a look at these. Um, 200 to 499 is high. Greater than 500 is very high. And you can see the estimated risk of myocardial infarction. Here we have uh, C-reactive protein that's broken down. So less than one mg per liter is low risk. One to three is normal. Greater than three is high risk. Greater than 10, not consistent with CHD. So homocysteine, people in indoor, with inborn errors of metabolism develop heart disease, heart disease in the teenage years. Levels of greater than 100 um, 
is indicative. Less than normal is less than 15. Mild elevations are also associated with CHD. May cause in direct injury to vascular endothelium mediated by inhibit inhibition of reactive oxygen species and may be marker of atherosclerosis. This is an algorithm for the assessment of CHD risk in children. So most of your questions on the qualifying exam are going to be about adults, but it's still good to kind of look at this and see what the similarities and differences are between adults and children.